My name is Richard, uh, Richard Lloyd. I'm a guitarist mostly. I um, was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and uh, I moved to New York when I was six or seven and lived and grew up in Greenwich Village. My mother was a, an actress, uh, um, and my father uh, was a film editor and made TV commercials. Uh, so I, we're talking about the 60s, and I was a teenager uh, in the middle 60s and uh, growing up in Greenwich Village and going to school here um, there was something very obvious about the cultural center of the world you know to us we knew in a way that we were living on the edge of something that was very profound and powerful or at least that's how we felt one of the reasons was that fashions uh, would filter down to the rest of the country that, that, and slang would move from New York to the rest of the country and musical tastes would move from New York to the rest of the country over the course of a matter of two to three years. So that no matter what the sort of uh, you know global United States was into, we had already done that and we were moving on. So there was a real sense uh, of this, you know, spearhead quality, I think, in New York. And even though I was younger than some of the people who were, you know, making art, I mean, basically, I'm of an age where I'm too young to be a beatnik, slightly older than the hippie, and, you know, right in the middle, sort of being an observer, if anything, well, I was going to school right. and uh, buying records and, uh, you know, having that uh, whatever the, you know, hormonal and vibrational and electric charge that people have when they're a teenager, you know, uh, wondering what they're going to become and what they're going to do and how they're going to do it and, you know, where's the explosion, you know, so I can go towards it of whatever it is that's going to be my life. I was influenced by the radio, AM radio. You know, there was no FM really at the time, so it was AM radio, and it was real crap and pap. Uh, you know, so when I joined a record club, you know, I would scour the records, and the only things that I could get that were of any value were like Ventures and uh, Dave Clark Five, and you know, I mean, it was still pablum. Um, you know, the Beatles came along. And that, of course, changed everything, followed by the rest of the bands, uh, you know, the English bands, Rolling Stones and Kings, Hermans, Hermits. Some were more sort of gruff than others, and some were more mature than others, and some were, you know, more Tin Pan Alley than others. But that was a real sea change for everybody. I never went, uh, we went down to McDougal Street and to uh, Bleecker Street, mostly to uh, acquire illegal substances from the older brothers who were the beatniks and the folkies. But for me and for, for myself, I have never had an interest in folk music. In fact, I would say, and as a musician, as a guitarist, I am... A, completely an electric musician, I'm interested in, in the electricity. I, when I saw, for instance, the Beatles and Rolling Stones, and I saw that they had this mass hysteria around them, a kind of hypnosis, a kind of frothing at the mouth frenzy going on, you know, amongst the fans, I looked, you know, first on TV, and I wondered, what is the, how are they doing this? That was my real question. And folk acts don't do that. So uh, there came a time, I think it was in the 66, 67, when the electric guitar became more prominent as an instrument and was no longer the simple backing of the song, that I suddenly had this epiphany that it was the electric guitar that was the sort of magic wand upon which all of this other thing was riding. And to me, a folk guitar is uh, completely pedestrian nothing. So if it isn't plugged in, I wasn't interested in it. I had friends that were really into Bob Dylan. Uh, one of them was uh, the son of uh, uh, the Leakey, 
Eric Leakey, uh, or maybe that's the son's name. I haven't talked to him in so long. You know, the anthropologist? Oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Then he used to force me to listen to Bob, the early, early Bob Dylan records, you know. And, uh, I mean, I can understand the power of the language and the... And in hindsight, you know, I mean, I had an incredible sort of opening to that force a little later on. But at the time, it was like, you know, I listened politely, and it wasn't plugged in, so to hell with it. Got me interested in music in the first place was probably the little baby toy piano, but it was a real piano. It only had 28 keys or something, but you could act... I mean, it was an acoustic instrument. And the idea that, the, like, you would hit a note, I mean, I'm talking when I'm three years old, you know, and you would hit a note or two and they would either, they would either be friends or they would be not friends. And I remember going to my parents at the time and saying, you know, I can make two notes sound good together and I can, so, when I play three notes, sometimes they sound good together and sometimes they don't. And, you know, uh, can anybody show me how to make consistent three notes sound good together? And everybody went, well, no, we can't play the piano, and, you know, that's that. So I would sit there, but I would play one note, and I would wonder, you know, like when you strike a bell, when does it end? And I would sit and I would listen, and I would strike one note, and I would sit there for a half hour. trying to follow it home because to my ear if it diminished in t volume it could never really go away so so it has to be somewhere and it's traveling some some distance you know and this was my search and that went on for quite a while you know so I think when I was a teenager uh, you know I started banging on things I became a drummer I actually took lessons and then uh, I had this strange experience one day while I was playing drums. The drums used to be very colorful to me. And all the cymbals and uh, the various drums had different tonalities. And one day I was playing them, and uh, like uh, the Wizard of Oz, all the color went out. Like it went to grayscale, and, I, and it was like tin. And I was hitting the drums, and I was going, where is the pleasure? It went away. And a voice, you know, an external or audio hallucination came and said, you need to play a melody instrument. So I had cousins that had guitars and that were sort of a rockabilly people, you know, back in Pittsburgh. And I would, uh, when I visited them, I would play their guitars. So that's how I began. So did you have aspirations when you were playing or did you just... Kind of well, the th strange thing is, you know, growing up in Greenwich Village, I actually saw people, uh, you know, like the Rolling Stones uh, on the street, you know, when they were in town a couple of times. In fact, once I told some people at this um, uh, uh, music instruction school that was on Barrow Street, you know, that I'd just seen Charlie Watts outside, and everyone ran out the door, and ch and I came out, and I saw more Charlie, ran down the street and turned the corner. And they're chasing after him. It was like just like Hard Day's Night. I was like, wow, <laughs> I felt so bad, you know. But they were, you know, when you're younger, a few years makes a lot of difference. And when you're older, it sort of mellows out. But, in, you know, so, so you would look up at these people, and now I realize they weren't that much older, you know, seven years older, nine years older but it, there was a world of difference I mean they were out of school and I was in school and so you know there was that impenetrable barrier and they were on TV you know and I was uh, you know doing homework so but yes there was that uh, the kind of notion also that there's something going on and if there's room you know uh, uh, it's like a pyramid game, in a way. N not everyone is going to win that gets in because it's a scheme. It starts with Elvis, and that's one, and it goes to the Beatles, and that's four, and then it goes to the Stones and, and Dylan, and that becomes ten, and then it's a hundred. And now, you know, every person in America, a third of the population of America is in a rock band. 
So by the time that occurs, you know, your chances are slim to none. So there's this incredible sense of A, that your chances are slim to none, and B, that in order to do it, you have to cross a certain bridge that you can't return from. You have to abandon some hopes. Like, for instance, to be a successful musician, I think you have to enjoy poverty and homeless, pretty much homelessness. You know the fam the joke where, you know, a, a musician without a girlfriend is homeless. But I think you have. To, I think that's part and parcel of the price that one has to pay. So you examine yourself and you say, you know, am I willing to pay that price? Am I willing to, you know, is my hunger that deep and that profound? Am I willing to sacrifice? Uh, I, 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 there are people in India, for instance, that they practice a kind of yoga, fakirism, and they will hold their hands up like this for 12 years. 12 years is the recognized standard after which you get something, but your arm can't, you can't bring it down. It's calcified, you know? And you, so I'm telling someone about this and they say, well, that's disgusting to put, you know, a human body and like to waste it like that. And I said, well, you work for IBM. You sit at a desk chasing money. You know, what are you going to end up at the end of the, you're going to end up with money when you die. Maybe this guy gets something else. So to me, rock and roll is something like that. It's a, a, a pearl of such worth that it's worth sticking your arm up for 12 years to get. I mean, what did Dylan do? You know, yeah. Dylan, I mean, he just chucked it, left with $10, you know, and stuck his thumb out. And, you know, <laughs> there has to be some kind of, that's foolish, coupled with a certain hope and a certain you know, uh, joy de vie and devil may, devil may care. Uh, you know, there's something extraordinary about that. And you have to have that. You well, 65, I mean, we just waited at the corner for the record store to open when, a, when any of these bands' records were coming out. I mean, I, you know, the camps of the Beatles, Rolling Stones, I mean, I appreciate both, but f my own sort of proclivity is that if everybody likes something, then I have to rail against it. And so the Beatles were sort of, you know, I thumbed my nose a little bit at that. The pop sensibility, the Tin Pan Alley quality, and I mean, I was a much more of a, a rabid Rolling Stones fan. Um, you know, and the other bands uh, were also in the mix. You know, I mean, I followed, because of, I did what a lot of people do was that I followed the English bands back to their influences, which meant that I returned to the blues. And so I listened to a lot of uh, blues and folk blues and uh, stuff like that, you know. Buddy Guy and Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf and uh, Robert Johnson and uh, Chicago blues, uh, you know, electric blues I preferred to the, to the stuff that... I had friends that studied with... Uh, um, well, now I'm going to ruin my answer because I can't think of the fellow's name off the top of my head. Reverend Gary Davis, blind Reverend Gary Davis. You know, so that Sonny McGee and Brown, uh, Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee. You know, I'm getting them all mixed up, you know. I'll never be forgiven. <laughs> Edit that. You Edit know, that you have out. an editing floor. <laughs> yeah, well, the yeah. only thing is that the tape doesn't end up on it. It's a delete button. I mean, when did Paul Butter Butterfield Blues Band record come out? That's 65. 65 was a big year. And that's where Dylan came out with the, that half electric, half folk record. You know, so there was that. Um, God, so many things I wish I had, <laughs> you know, today. It kind of get lost in the vinyl uh, transition to CD. Well, a, a big thing happened also, as I, I, I kind of was talking about. It. For me, when the Grateful Dead's first record came out, and Jimi Hendrix's first record came out, and Pink Floyd's first record came out, and there were a couple of others, but the, those three uh, were, th instead of the song and instead of the voice, the guitar became the principal's uh, f center. Um, 
to me, that changed to absolutely everything. And that's kind of what I'd been waiting for. So, um, you know, the Jeff Beck group, uh, the Led Zeppelin first offering, I think that was a little later, however, but those kinds of very forceful electric guitar statements were really what um, influenced me completely in a way that I'd say, you know, still, I mean, I'm still reverberating from. They cause chromatic changes, d DNA damage, you know, good stuff. Mu <laughs> you turn you into a mutant, you know. Damage or enhancement. One or enhancement, the other. <laughs> you know, well, that's the thing. You have to take your chances. It could be either or, you see. You know, you don't get to choose. You get, you get the Cracker Jacks box, but you don't know what's going to be in it, you know. And one day I was at the f a friend of mine's house, and he said, oh, no. He got off the phone. He said, oh, no, this kid's coming over, and he says he knows Jimi Hendrix. And w we should all laugh at him. And there were a group of about ten of us at this guy's house. And I thought, well, that's not very nice, you know. But anyway, the, f the doorbell rang sometime later, and uh, the door opened, and it was a scrawny black kid, uh, tall, scrawny black kid. His name is Velvert Turner. And I looked at him, and I said, you know what? He does know Jimi Hendrix. You're all full of shit, you know. And they started pulling the, you know, this crap on him, like, you know, you, you know, what's the matter with you? You don't know. And he was near tears, and I stood up for him. Anyway, he proceed, we proceeded to the kitchen, and he got on the telephone and called the Warwick Hotel and asked for somebody, not Jimi Hendrix, he asked for somebody's name. I don't know who it was. And they were all pointing fingers and laughing. He goes, well, he's not under his own name. And they are like, ha, 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 ha. And the phone rang and rang, and Velvet's like, I ca I've done what I can. You don't believe me. Here's the phone. And it's ringing. And he handed it around the table, and when it got to me, Jimmy picked up. He had been sleeping. I guess it was like 4.30. It was after school. So. And uh, after that, Velvet and I became be pretty much best friends, you know, and uh, started going to Hendrix shows and uh, other shows. And, and we started going to uh, Steve Paul's scene. And this is like 68, uh, 67, 68, and uh, concerts at the Fillmore. And, I mean, something big, bigger was happening, you know. Uh, it's very odd now when I look back at it because I wouldn't have let myself in. You know, I mean, this is like 14, 15-year-old kid who's actually in bars and uh, drinking and, you know, and following r rock musicians around. Uh, we figured out some tricks, you know. I mean, on top of the fact that he was actually... Velvet had seen Jimmy like somehow on TV and actually said, I've got to meet that guy, and f chased him down and found him, and Jimmy had sort of uh, taken this kid under his wing. So, uh, you know, but we also figured out that we could do things like we would hang around Steve Paulsine, and then when a band came in, we would ask them to take us in with them, you know, Chambers Brothers or Buddy Guy or Jimmy or whoever was walking in. And we could also go to sound checks. I'm amazed that people don't do this, you know, more. But sound check security isn't there yet. It's four thirty in the afternoon. You go to sound check and you go up to the band member and you say, you know, I'm a fan and I don't have a ticket. And you know, is it possible for me to get into the show? You know, I'm a guitar player. Blah blah blah. And oftentimes, musicians traveling, you know, they don't have full guest lists. I shouldn't be saying this, cause, <laughs> you know, but. Um, that's what we did, and uh, you know, and we kind of formed a little club where we would uh, carry guitars around all the time. For a few years, you couldn't be, you know, if you got caught without a guitar. So I took the guitar to school, you know, and and stopped taking my school books. And one day I got in quite a bit of trouble because the teacher said, well, where are your books? And I said, they're in the case. And, they said, and he said, well, Mr. Lloyd, open the case up. Open the case, there's a guitar. He says, well, that doesn't look like a book to me. I said, that's the book I'm studying. And he said, well, where are your other books? I said, no, 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 that's the only book. I've made a decision, you know. And they said, well, you know. 
And I said, well, give me tests, you know. And if I fail the tests, you know, I'll, I'll, I will do homework again, you know. But I didn't really mean it. <laughs> but I somehow managed to get by, you know, in that way. And, and that was a part of that sort of decision making. Yeah. So, um, you know, and I, we went to the Fillmore and, and these other places, you know. So one might say I had a research project going on. So I, I can't talk exactly about how it felt in the clubs because my, really one of my goals was from the moment that I saw the Rolling Stones and the Beatles on television, I wanted to know what these people had I mean, uh, to me, it was, they were human, they were no different than I, they might have been older and they had some accomplishments, craft, craft and talent perhaps, but there was something else in the way of, let's say, personal power or influence whereby people were going gagas over these young men. And I wanted basically to get close enough to a... a figure out what it, whether they actually had something magical or whether, you know, I wanted to know what was, I mean, you have to, like, you can look at a magnet from across the street, but you don't know if the force field, you don't know about it till you get close enough. And so I wanted to get close enough. And that's, that was sort of the whole aim, you know, coupled with the fact that you kind of make this decision I mean, I, people used to laugh because I'd say, well, they'd say, well, what are you going to be when you grow up? And I'd say, well, I already am what I'm going to be when I grow up. And they'd well, what's that? i say, well, I'm a, I make records and I'm a musician. And they'd say, but you can't even play. And I'd say, well, that, that's irrelevant. You know, that's just now. I'm talking, you ask people about the future, and I'm telling you about the future, but you're not listening. And they would all laugh and scratch their heads and walk away, you know. So it was all a kind of, to me, it was a kind of preparation and, and understanding. Yeah. But the clubs, you know, I mean, you know, where do, pe where do people who are on the cusp of something exciting go and let their hair down? I mean, you know, that's what a lot of these places felt like, you know, nightclubs and... Yeah. No, I was f pretty, pretty well focused as yeah. a musician. Now, you know, um, I mean, I... I there are people that are into poetry and they're into uh, various other media and um, that's terrific you know and one can be a renaissance type of person you know but I really was a specialist in a way yeah did like the Max's scene appeal to you at all or oh yeah but this just didn't happen until later what happened was 1968 69 you know uh, uh, um, came along and I finished school and uh, you know was had to get out of my parents house and I had a choice I kind of went well should I go to London or should I go to Los Angeles and um, in the meantime a bunch of my friends had gone to Boston so I, actually I went to Boston for a year and they studied at Berkeley and what, what have you and I uh, went up there with a few other friends one of whom was Al Albert Anderson the Al Anderson that played with later with Bob Marley in the Whalers, the only American to play in the Whalers. And in any case, we were up there, and uh, you know, Aerosmith, I guess, was just a frat band at the time, that kind of thing. And then I came back to New York for a little bit, but then I went to Los Angeles and continued my uh, research, you know, by going to a lot of record company shindigs and you know, jumping into swimming pools and, you know, looking at that. So when it, what happened was that I had heard, I began to hear that there was a scene in New York, it was, the, and the New York Dolls were big. I'm not even sure if they had had a record on, maybe that one first record, at the Mercer Arts Center. And I said, well, finally, you know, some, I'm, I'm hearing about something in my hometown, you know, something new. And I felt like, uh, you know, it was getting close to be time to do something myself. You know, you can only keep a cake in the oven so long. So I got, I knew a friend who was driving to New York from Los Angeles, and we drove across the country. And on the way, uh, we heard news that the Mercer Arts Center had fallen down. <laughs> so the scene that I was on my way to 
you know, join had fallen down. But when we got to New York, um, I gravitated to Max's Kansas City and probably spent a couple of years, you know, there pretty much every day, both in the afternoon for free chicken wings and, <laughs> and at night for, you know, whatever it was that was happening there. And uh, that was quite a scene. So. Yeah. Um, so. Much bigger than Steve Paul's scene. Tell me about that. I mean, I mean Steve Paul's scene is a room. This it's a very small room. It's now I I often go down. It's a, in a basement on Forty Sixth Street, and since I'm in the neighborhood, I you know I stop in. It's a, a video store, mostly pornography. But you know I stop in, and I'm there because you know that was like. Wow, some things happen there, you know, and every once in a while they'll ask me, what are, you know, you're looking for a video? No, I'm here because it was the scene, and they're going, like, yeah, I heard about that. You know, and Hendrix and the Doors and, the, you know, used to play, and but Jimmy, um, you know, so, but it was a very, that was a very small, after, almost after hours club, whereas Max's was a reputable bar that had turned into this giant, you know, circus you know, of multimedia, the Andy Warhol thing. And that's where I met Terry Ork, who was one of the Warhol, he, basically he was a silk screener, you know, because Andy would have people make 50 to 100 copies of whatever, you know, electric chairs or Maryland's, and then he would sign them and they would sell. So he did that and a few other things and was a big admirer of Warhol's sort of uh, social ethic, ethic, ethics. And Terry had this giant loft in Chinatown, and I had, basically was staying at girlfriends and places. And so Terry said, "Oh, I have an extra room. You know, you can come and stay there." So I went and I began living in in Chinatown with Terry, and uh, Terry really wanted to manage a band or be, have a band. He wanted to kind of follow that exploding plastic inevitable idea of multimedia socialism and have a band and and he was going to put together a band for me and one day he said well I have this guy he does what you do I mean he's just playing electric guitar by himself and he's playing up at this supper club you know and I did audition night and uh, you want to go see him and I said I don't know and then the day came and uh, he was going up and I okay fine so we went that and that was Tom Verlaine and that was the night I met Tom and Richard Hell. And when Tom played, he played three songs, and I turned to Terry and I said, you know, Terry, if you put me and him together, you'll have what you're looking for. You should forget about a band for me. You should get the, the two of us together because he's got something, very you know, something real, and but he's missing something. What he's missing, I've got. And what I'm missing, he's got. And then uh, Terry talked to Tom about it. Tom and Richard came and talked to me about it. And that's how television began to be formed. And that was in 73. Uh, well, television you, came yeah. about in, the, in that way. And then we started rehearsing. And we didn't have a drummer. And Tom said, well, I know a guy who used to play with Richard and I. Oh, Richard didn't want to pull. He didn't want to join. His job was he was the semi- he was sort of, sort of stylist, manage, Tom's stylist, manager, f best friend, uh, you know, who would run over to you and go, you're not tattered enough, and literally tear your T-shirts, you know, get us, if they didn't give, he'd get a scissors and tear them up. So it was the, this whole sort of anti-glamour, or what I call the glamour of the impoverished boy runaway. The uh, the kind of street urchin finds a guitar in the gutter, and suddenly you know churns out this incredible, demented, uh, multi-layered, uh, poetic uh, kind of uh, erotic rock, and that's what that's really what television had in the very beginning. And this incredible energy that this w was like y you had something boiling and you let the lit, you took the lid off and everything escaped. You know, Pandora's box kind of thing of giddiness. 
And Terry, uh, anyway, he said, I know this great drummer, Billy Ficka. And so Billy came, and we began rehearsing. And then Terry put the sort of uh, thing in into motion, his idea of managing a band. And we there was no place to play. So we rented a small theater on 44th Street. It had 88 seats. Uh, West 44th Street, Townhouse Theater, across from Town Hall. And uh, we thought, well, no, no we got to put an ad in the paper. So we had some photographers take pictures of us. And then we thought, well, you know, how are we going to get a buzz on? So what we did was we went to journalists that Terry knew and invited them to see us rehearse and ask them for soundbite quotes that we could put in the ads. And I think the three we ended up using were, Terry was friends with Nicholas Ray, who directed uh, Rebel Without a Cause. He came down, um, bribed with a uh, giant bottle of, of wine, you know, a quarter gallon of wine, or a so half gallon, of wine, which, which Nicholas proceeded to finish. And then he gave us a quote. And I think Danny Fields, who had been, you know, managing Iggy, and and, uh, and he, we stopped him on the street, and... And he said, oh, I don't have to see the band. Here's a quote. <laughs> he said, I can't believe you're just asking me for a quote. You know, what a lot of nerve. That's great. <laughs> here, here you go. So he gave us a quote, and Lenny Kay gave us a quote, and a few other people gave us a quote. And so he put this little ad in the paper, you know, television. And Terry did some hard work, and, you know, the place was filled. But that was how it was. You had to rent a place because... You were playing original music, and, and it was had all the ad, the description I had already given you. Now, nobody is going to book this. In fact, you know, a guy from a record company said, you know, I can't sign television. It's not earth music, which is exactly, you know, yes, that's right. You know, it's it's something else. It's it's uh, So we kept doing this, renting little places, or once in a while you could get a gig upstairs at Max's or you know, here or there. It was terrible. You only got to play every three months if you were lucky. And, you know, how could you sustain anything? We had thought about the, you know, Beatles in Hamburg, you know, playing their asses off every night. How that, you know, we were rehearsing a lot. And so we began to talk about getting a place where we could be the house band out of the way, somewhere that nobody else would want it, but that we could just hone our craft. And one day Tom came to rehearsal and he said, you know, I saw, walking down the Bowery, he said, I saw a guy who's putting up a sign, awning on a bar, and I think he's going to have live music. Uh, you know, may, will you go up and we can talk to him about, uh, maybe we could, we could play a gig there. And so uh, I went up with him and it, Hilly was up putting up the CBGB sign and he came downstairs, he was very nice, and he went inside and he said, well, I'm going to have country bluegrass and blues. And uh, we said, well, we play rock, but, you know, it's a really original. It's nothing like you've ever heard before, and there's kind of a little blues in it, and a little, you know, we sort of fibbed. And he said, well, I don't know. And he said, well, w w he was going to have the place be like a drive-in movie. That was his gimmick. He was going to have the stage at the very big front of the club, and we said, oh, no, don't, you do, please, Hilly, don't do that. He, he said, why not? He says, well, you'll get noise complaints. Oh, I'm not going to have loud music, he said. We said, oh, boy. And he said, we said, well, the ticket taker is going to be right next to the band. You know, if she has to talk to customers, you know, that won't be good. And But the biggest complaint is that when people decide they want to go home, they're going to have to walk right past the band. It's going to be demoralizing. So he said, well, where do you think I should put the stage? So we told him, in the middle of the club, and that's where he put the stage. And uh, Terry went to talk to him and said, I'll guarantee you, you know, what, he said, what's your, give me your worst night. And he said, that's Sunday. He said, and what are your usual bar receipts on a Sunday, you know, from this few drunks that straggle in? And he said, well, I'll guarantee you double that. And it, because everyone I invite is an alcoholic. <laughs> from Max's, you know. And Terry invited a bunch of people down, and, you know, and it, it, we did okay. And then he gave us another Sunday, and that's how it began. And then, you know, some other bands heard about 
hey, there's a place where we can play our original music, and they began coming by, and I talked to Hilly, and Hilly would say, we'll talk to Terry, and, you know, and uh, Terry was, then really Terry saw something, you know, like, oh, you know, I can, I can all, not only that, but I can grandfather the club, and I can really put my tentacles out, you know, in order, because then my band will have other bands to play with, and, you know, we can draw on that. And that's really how it came about. And so there, there began a kind of a, a year-long, two-year, really, campaign. Because Max's was filled to overflowing. And upstairs was sometimes, cr where they had live music, was sometimes crowded, sometimes not crowded. I mean, I went there once, and they said, oh, you should go upstairs and see this guy. He's like a D Detroit rock. Like, uh, man, he's like um, Mitch Ryder. Uh, it's going to be big. So I went upstairs, but there was a bunch of, bunch of uh, guys in dreadlocks playing hypnotic sort of, you know, trance music. And I said, well, what is this? this is... So I went back downstairs, you know, where because there was like 20 people there. And that was uh, Bob Marley opening for Bruce Springsteen. And nobody was there, you know. So sometimes they would have crowds and sometimes, because the party was downstairs. So it took two years to get people to come down to the Bowery because CBGB's was under a flop house and literally in cracks, wine and urine would drip down on the stage and on customers. And Hilly had this Saluki dog that would crap everywhere. And, you know, I mean, when you came in, there you might have to step over a bum. I mean, we had picked the place basically because we thought, well, finally, you know, we got a home nobody's going to kick us out of. You know, that was the, the, that was the overriding concern, to have some place to woodshed. And then there was the, you know, hellish proposition of trying to get people to come down, especially record company people, you know, who are all very, you know, um, snooty, as it were, and, you know, upscale. So when did you, actually, where were you guys rehearsing? What was kind of... Chinatown, in Terry's Loft. Oh, you were, re okay. We rehearsed in Ch Terry's Loft, uh, f like, six days a week for five hours. Wow. Yeah, and it didn't help. <laughs> 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 it really didn't help. Oh. So when did you first start recording? When did you start going into studios and recording? Oh, that was probably... Um, pretty early um, the next year and uh, we did some sort of demos we got a four track and we did a few things and we did a few more things and uh, and we weren't getting anybody to come down and see us so uh, we thought well you know we should put out our own we'll put out our own 45 you know something to you know, uh, keep the ball rolling, as it were. So we did, and we put out... Uh, the idea was a f a from James Brown, used to have uh, Hot Pants Parts 1 and Part 2, so we did this Little Johnny Jewel Parts 1 and Part 2, you know, where... because it was, like, too long to put on a single side, so... And that was our first single. And then, uh, you know, and it, it did okay, and then the God, God strangest thing happened. It got a one-paragraph review in Penthouse magazine. And all of a sudden, we started getting bucket loads of, of uh, you know, because it was $2 you sent to a post office box. We started getting, like, bucket loads. You know, Terry would come back from the post office, a shopping bag full of orders for this thing based on this little review like this in Penthouse. That's too funny. It was, it was very funny. And the band hand, you know, we took, bought pieces of cardboard and we, you know, put them in the envelope and licked them and, you know, and stamped them and sent them out. So we had our little cottage industry. Who knew, right? <laughs> who, who, who knew? Um, well, I, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I was going to say Patti Smith it was doing the same thing with the, her piss factory. So, you know, I mean, it was a... It was, well, if they're not going to put the records out, you know, uh, we've got to. Right. So, 
kind of how did things change from 65 to 75? Oh my God, from 65 to 75? Uh, well, I'll tell you what didn't change. In 65, television had no music on it whatsoever of any popular, you know, there was orchestral music in, in shows. In 75, there was the beginning of a disco in some shows, you know, uh, and um, but there was no rock and roll on television, zero, none. So there had been this movement from, you know, I mean, obviously, 65 is really the beginning of something, electric rock music, you know, bands. That's really the 65, 66, 67. That's really the beginning of it. And... Uh, Unfortunately, you, you know, that uh, sort of ended in 69, 70, and then you had that wave of uh, sort of corporate, structured, uh, you know, bombastic rock, which kind of uh, is the way of anything when you have something extraordinary and fresh and suddenly it becomes profitable then you have the follow-through of uh, how can I make it more palatable? How can I make it more uh, seamless? How can I make it more, um, you know, uh, like a pablum to sell to the masses? And then that happened, you know, and you had, well, then you had glam, and you had really two aspects of it. You had the, the Bowie-esque, Slade kind of uh, high end glam, and then you had the dolls, which was really that beginning. I mean, I guess you, in other places you had the uh, Stooges and, and you had the Velvet Underground, this really filthy under, you know, completely raw thing, you know. Uh, uh, like, uh, you know, like John Carpenter's The Thing, you know, the evil carrot, the the rock that's going to eat up, you know, but it's filthy, you know, you can't go home with that, you know, you can't sell that to Missouri, you know. So I think that what happened by 75 in New York was, uh, I mean, we weren't even, I mean, we were still just kids, you know, but there was a kind of a rebelliousness against that machinery that we couldn't get them interested in us if we set ourselves on fire. So there was something actually refreshing about the about being rejected. And I think that that you know, I think that takes place. Always. It's like uh, kneading dough. <laughs> you know, there's a certain cycle to it, and then it'll happen again. Yeah. That's kind of exactly what we're talking about. Because yeah, mm. we kind of think, you know, from 65 to 75, it's almost full circle. Because, like, the folk stuff was really do it yourself, you know. If you have something to say, write a song and say it, you know, and then by the time sure. we get to punk, it's like, who cares if you can play? If you got something to say, say it, you know, and in the middle is all of this well-funded, you mm. know, yeah. overblown. In a way that the, that kind of, I, I, you know, to me, the term folk music implies, uh, Acoustic instruments, you know, and you can't have, in a way, you can't have folk music in the city, <laughs> although there are folks in the city, you know, it's already an export from, like, the barn, you know, the hoot and nanny. Um, so it's a different kind of a thing, but I guess it's a, it's, it, it, it is a similar approach to what to do with your energy, 
you know, when you're not funded and what that means in terms of your art. So how did the feeling of New York change from 65 to 75? Like the city itself. I mean, you know, we had civil rights, you have Vietnam War, you have women's rights, you have, you know, all of these protest movements and this whole dynamic shift. But how did the city feel? You know what I mean? And I know part of it is just your aging process, you know, because as you well, grow Well, that's up, what I would say. Yeah. And then I'm missing for some of it, you know, because I left as a part of the natural you know, uh, necessity of the youth and prodigal sonism, you know, but um, I don't, th see, I'm, I'm, I don't take the party line that there's any sea change ever. I take the party line that there's always some, I mean, of course, cultures come and go, civilizations rise and fall, so there's always some sort of art, uh, um, you know, wave artistic wave going on but uh, I mean I think the city opened up a great deal to its own natives I don't think you could I mean it, it took until 73 4 5 for you to really find any sort of beginning of respect if you in New York if you came from New York in 65 you had to be from you know, elsewhere, either from England or from somewhere else, or from the mysterious nowhere, well, you know, like a Dylan, where you pop up out of, you know, the carnival, uh, which is the fabricated past. But I think in, um, you know, there began to become the flowering of an opportunity here, you know, for the natives to get restless, you know, what with the Velvet Underground and the dolls and that. I think that really opened things up. Yeah, definitely. Any thoughts on the Warhol scene? Like, did that change New York at all, or...? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, the thing about CBGB's that nobody, uh, or, you know, I guess it's been mentioned that has in common with the Warhol was the multimedia um, element. I mean, we were, it really felt like CBGB's was sort of the younger generational version of Max's and the, the Warhol scene uh, without a presiding artist, you know, above it, but, uh, as in Warhol. But, uh, I mean, what you had with Warhol was this in incredible uh, rubbing of shoulders of filmmakers and uh, and. Uh, paint artists and journalists and writers and musicians. And this you had the same thing going on at CBGB's because CBGB's would not be the sort of remembered as the cultural uh, force that it is remembered as if it weren't for the fact that on an, that it was not just musicians and simple fans of musicians in the audience. I mean, certainly there were fans in the audience who went on to whatever, you know, not, but more than in any other place I can think of, probably, you know, more than at the Marquee Club in, uh, in London when, the, you know, or Crawdaddy Club in London when bands were playing there, more than in Seattle when grunge was happening, but, you know, more it, you had... The, writers begin by creating journalisms around this scene, like Punk Magazine and New York Rocker. You had photographers who now, you know, you have a number of res absolutely well-respected, you know, historical photographers who began by coming there and then going, oh, I got to get a camera. You have musicians and you have writers uh, now of some note. Uh, so you have this real strong mix of, of the arts going on in a single place. I mean, it's hard to, to duplicate that uh, anywhere, but if you have a chance, New York's probably the best place to do it. Yeah, because that was a kind of our other thing. It's like this 10 years, more than any other that we can think of, there was a whole synthesis of the arts. Like it didn't matter what your medium was. It was just this creative hub. 
Well, I agree, I agree yeah. with you that there. Yeah. And it was a very powerful uh, glue, you know, that, that, the glue that you were not uh, above it w there was no like there was no musicians and then the paying customers there was this just vi i mean i saw it, it, it the first time i did see the dolls after i came back you know um i went to see them and they were playing some ballroom and there were you know 2000 people dressed to the nines at the concert and during the concert i noticed something that i had never seen at a musical concert before this is the first musical event in which I discovered that the audience was more interested in each other than they were in the band on stage. That they used the band as, as a leverage to come together and that it made not a hill of beans. I mean, you know, it had to be the dolls and it was the dolls, but it really meant no difference what they were playing because they were interested in, oh, look at you and look at you. I mean, that's what was going on. And I think CBGB's, you know, uh, benefited from and our scene there benefited from that sense that you hardly ever get anywhere you know that the world is full this world is full of interesting people you know nobody's dull <laughs> exactly um. Anything you think we? Oh, one thing I wanted to ask is, um, since you did go to Boston and L.A. and you know you were kind of out and about, yeah. What made New York different? I, I just have a completely organic sense of home about New York, and whenever I go anywhere else, I, uh, I look and say to myself, you know, it's an interesting place, but I, I just couldn't live here. And that includes everywhere I've ever been. Uh, I don't know why that is. I don't know why this town has that kind of appeal for me. I do know this. Uh, I have a friend, and a, a younger person who was in New York, and they were in a band, and the band broke up. And this person went back to from whence they came, right? And have since regretted it. But as I said to one of their friends, you know, New York now won't let them back. It's a tough place to come. When you come here, you know, New York can accept you and it can support you. But if you don't appreciate it in that special way, you know, it, it, it has a very firm energy and it can reject you. You know, it's too expensive. And I don't mean in money. It's too expensive to be here unless you have something that equates to that energy yeah. and so I don't think he'll be able to come back yeah. I think New York has spat him out <laughs> <laughs> exactly it's like once he rejected it's over that's that's right it's an unforgiving uh, friend <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly talk about grudges <laughs> that's right well I don't even think that I don't see it in in, in terms of a grudge but yeah. ju just more of well I'll show you you know exactly <laughs> <laughs> definitely um, and did Philip Glass enter your consciousness at all I mean because he started doing really <laughs> no. experimental music no <laughs> no no not mine maybe my compatriots you know yeah no, we did some recordings at a studio of his once. Did you? Yes, that's right. Tell me about that. Well, I we're actually supposed to interview him, so oh, I'm kind of curious. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was the, the ones, I believe, the, for Ireland. Oh, really? That Richard Williams uh, put together. But uh, the, the studio was so dry, and it didn't come off very well. And that was the last thing we did with Richard Hell. Um, you know, there's best left you know, to the, to say nothing more, except, you know, it's, anytime you go, if you're a band, you're so involved in what you're doing, you don't pay, you can't barely pay attention to what you're doing, let alone what the others are doing, and when you start to make records, it's a real, it can be a horrible experience to suddenly find yourself under a, uh, the glare of a microphone and the microscope of scrutiny and find out that, oh, Gee, you know, 
I'm not playing what I thought I was playing, and you know, so and so isn't really any good. <laughs> exactly, it's that mirror that's like, whoa. So don't don't use that though. That's unkind. No. There's no reason for that. No, no, no. Um, no, we only edit gracefully. We don't. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Um, and one thing that we're just curious about because it's like you know, multi-track recording in the studio. Like it went from basically live stuff, and I know you didn't start recording until it was already you know a handful of tracks. That's right. Um, uh, do you th think the technology has changed music in any way? Uh, if you're only talking about the decade from '65 to '75, uh, uh, not as much as it's changed since then. Um, Primarily because the the it was still recording was so expensive in terms of the equipment that it had to be done by professionals. In other words, you, nobody had home recordings that could uh, stand the scrutiny of the marketplace. And because it was done by professionals, uh, you know, it began with f four tracks. Although even the Beatles were done with really eight tracks, uh, two four tracks, you know. Um, and people figured out ways to make more tracks, even when they had, you know, eight tracks uh, by bouncing. But once you get to uh, eight or sixteen, I mean, the and to twenty-four, the recordings were principally being done by the same people, the recording engineers. So really, didn't the, 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 not much changed in that time. Except that with more channels, one could sort of uh, split the difference more, you know. But the basic tenets, I think, were pretty much the same. I think something did, however, change, and it had nothing to do with the recording equipment, but it had to do with the recording philosophy, and that is that in 65, um, far more things were done live than uh, and by 75 far more things were done by overdub now you could say that that might have something to do with the fact that now I recognize that I have so many track I have more tracks so I can do that whereas before I really couldn't do that but I think that there's a different another kind of a I think there's an, another element to the reason why there was that change having to do with the fact that bands um, no longer predicated their recordings on their live show so that they weren't, you know, by, by seven, even by 75, you know, bands weren't ready <laughs> really to record whole songs. Not some of the, the the punk bands, however, you know. <laughs> and how did while we're on recording, how did that change after '75? Because I know you still do a lot. Well, with the advent of the digital recorder, uh, suddenly uh, prices uh, plummeted, and. Uh, you know, rather than a tape machine the size of a refrigerator, you suddenly got uh, smaller and smaller boxes, so you can fit them in smaller and smaller places, and they cost less and less. So, people were able to actually uh, make records outside of the professional, you know, dedicated studio. And I don't think that's going to uh, uh, return. You know, like I don't think vinyl records are going to return, and I don't think tape is going to return, and uh, it may s continue for a while, but um, you know, it's a thing of the past. Well, the bands got signed that were in this one little, you know, it's kind of like, you know, the, that bit about um, the college kids piling into a phone b booth, you know. And they're all in the phone booths, so, so it's very hot in there, and something's going on, you know. And then one by one, somebody comes and plucks them away, 
and says, you know, I'm going to make you big in the world. Well, now you're too big. You can't fit in the phone booth anymore. So pretty soon the phone booth's empty. You know, then that you may think that makes more room, you know, but <laughs> not necessarily. And I mean, on all the, there have been a couple of other sort of waves, uh, recognized waves, um, you know, that, 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 melting pot I, I, I don't even the convection oven or you know the, the, the pressure cooker really uh, stopped existing mm -hmm. yeah, and the energy disperses and yeah I mean, you know, it goes elsewhere yeah. you know Minneapolis or Seattle or Athens Georgia or wherever yeah. I mean it doesn't come back you know, now it's just a memory, you know. I mean, it may, even even if a club continues to be successful, you know, it, it has an aging process just like a person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that the theater is a terrific place for a rock band uh, with seating, you know. And uh, I mean, there's a real differential between the, between a club and a theater. And the Fillmore, I think, was one of the first places. I, I mean, it was the first place in New York where those bands could be brought to a kind of new level, you know, where they weren't playing clubs, where you could sit down and appreciate a, a different sort of, in a way, the size of that place and the way it made, uh, made a rock band much more like a movie, like going to see something, you know, uh, bigger than life. You know, where when, you, when you're in a club... You know, there's you're the same size as life, and when you enter this bigger place with the stage, um, you know something comes with it. That's all. I never went to the Electric Circus because I had friends in the seventh and eighth grade who got into the Velvet Underground, and one day I went over to their house and they put the record on and started shooting heroin, and I thought, oh no, that's ain't for me. <laughs> Later on, it became for me, but no, at the time I thought, oh no, these people are you know, going down. So I'm going to stay away from that. So unfortunately, you know, I missed the... I, I took... I, that was too strong an impression. So, I, <laughs> you know. Uh, I just read the biography of... the newer biography of Jimi Hendrix, which talks about Kawashi's influence on him in terms of the show. You know, he was the limbo king. But I missed all that, so... You know... Except for rubbing uh, elbows and drinking it together at the uh, Maxis. No, I never went to those sort of lower end blues bar type places. Yeah, you, you know. didn't really do the Bleecker Street scene at all. <coughs> no. What about Club 82? Well, Club 82 was great because, you know, after we'd been at CBGB's for a while, you know, we kind of needed another place. I mean, it wasn't like you can't just be only there. That we were always looking for other places to other opportunities to play. There was a place, Great Gilder Sleeves, opened up down the block, but that was a real. Com it was too close, and if you played there, you know, you threatened your tenure at Seabees. With Club Eighty Two around the corner on Eighth Street was an a on uh, West Four East Fourth Street it was an after hours club run by really hard dykes. And it was a transsexual, transvestite bar after hours. And so we began getting, they began having music, you know. And you would play like your shows would be at 2 a.m. or something, as I recall. And we started playing there. And then, you know, that's another element that, that you know, that Hilly didn't have that was absolutely, we really liked it, you know. So uh, you've got this gaudiness and you've got this, uh, you know, hard-edged thing. And then you have the, the bands coming in, you know. Uh, it was really quite an a, a astonishing thing going on there. It was not on the Bowery, so it became a certain kind of a different f form of acceptable to go there. You know, and a bunch of people started going there, like uh, Bowie and uh, John Lennon, and and then, unfortunately, uh, 
the suburban people heard about it, and you know, and then there were lines around the block to get in. So, the bridge and tunnel crowd, as it's called. Oh, certainly, that would have been part of the guitar club. I mean, yeah, for for several years, I carried it around in a hard shell case, you know, and thought about getting handcuffs so uh, I could, you know, cause, no, I mean, you know, you'd carry it around. I hardly played it, but and I carried it around. And I suppose that I either lost the case or decided, you know, it's this is easier to just strap it on. And, you know, there was that kind of... Uh, Wearing it on your back like an M16 carbine, there was that. You know, the folk hero uh, used to do that, you know. So it was, it was strung across your back, you know, the guitar across your back, you know. It's just an image. Yeah, well, I really, I have no idea except that, you know, uh, what do they say? Good tide lifts all boats and uh, the wind blows on all the trees, so, <laughs> you know. We were all visited by the simultaneous muse. You know, that's often the case with inventions, too. You know, that there are suddenly, uh, it's sort of, I think there was the philosopher, what was his, uh, I can't think of the guy's name. I'm bad with names today. Um, you know, the idea of the the mind, the single bio mind, you know, and the, it thinks of something, and then we're receptacles of it, like radio, if your station, if your radio's operating, and if your tuner is turned to there, then that's what you get, you get boing, you get, oh, you know, an idea, and so several people can have the same idea at the same time. It's a real mistake to think that creativity is ours, because creativity, by definition, this sort of abstract uh, what conundrum. Creativity is something that uh, is new and un it can't come from the elements in yourself that you have. That's just craft. That's not creativity. It has to come from uh, elsewhere. That's why the Greeks said the gods of the muses, they visit you. It's not yours. It's a real mistake to think that your talent is yours because uh, it isn't. Well, you know, there's a high frame uh, photography has shown that a lightning doesn't come down as much as it goes both way. In, in other words, a lightning storm will present a charge and it will dip the charge down to about 200 yards from the ground. And then it waits while everything on the ground goes like, me, me, me. And the one with the highest hopes, you know, meets up with the charge and then it discharges downwards, you know. And so New York and some of us here, you know, had our hands up, you know, like, call on me. 